Today we'll discuss the most secretive Space Marines chapter in the Imperium, numbered 666 and known as the Grey Knights. They are the Imperium's last hope and a powerful defence against demons of all kinds. Settle in comfortably as I begin the tale of the Grey Knights. The Grey Knights are an Astartes chapter that falls under the military arm of the Inquisition, specifically the Ordo Malaeus, which specialises in fighting the spawn of chaos. Only the Inquisition knows of the chapter's existence because officially for the Imperium, demons still do not exist. They are not taught about in schools, nor are posters of Bellicor displayed in the squares of terror. Therefore, officially, there are also no demon fighters in the Imperium. When I said that the Grey Knights are a secret chapter, I was not joking. All Space Marines who encounter them on the battlefield are later sent for memory wiping, and the regiments of the Imperial Guard are simply executed because changing the memories of so many people is very difficult. The origin story of the Grey Knights is just as mysterious, but we know a little about them. According to legend, when the War Master's company reached Terra and the final battle of the Heresy occurred, the Emperor realised that he could no longer protect humanity from demons as he had before. If Horus died, chaos would not simply disappear and would continuously thwart the Imperium. Understandably, he had his loyal custodes, but they already had their hands full with guarding the palace and the Emperor himself, so the Emperor decided to implement his plan. He sent Malkador the Sigilite to find the worthiest warriors who could form the backbone of a new organization. The Sigilite himself found twelve worthy candidates. Among them were four Lords of Terror and eight Space Marines from different legions who had survived and defended the Imperium till the very end. Many of them were from traitor legions but remained loyal to the Emperor, and it was from them that the Brotherhood of the Grey Knights was formed. Let's start, perhaps, with the Grand Master Epimetheus. Epimetheus was originally a member of the Dark Angels Legion and served on Caliban under the command of Luther. However, he did not fall from grace. There is a rumour that he was once called Nemean and he was from Terra as well as being a veteran of the Third Rangdan Xenocide, during which he scarred his face such that Nemean always covered his face with a hood. It seems he survived thanks to the most powerful combat armor created before the Imperium during the Dark Age of Technology. During the Horus Heresy, Nemean formed a gang of black shields known as the Dark Brotherhood, and was quite successful in killing traitor Xenos until he became a wandering knight of Malkador the Sigilite, and stood with the other new recruits before the Emperor. After joining the new, highly secretive chapter of the Grey Knights, Nemean declared that he had never had a name, and henceforth he was called Epimetheus. In truth, it didn't matter which brotherhood Epimetheus belonged to, because after being accepted into the Grey Knights, his gene seed was removed and replaced with a new one that was set aside for the founding of the Grey Knights. Consequently, Epimetheus took command of the fifth brotherhood of the Grey Knights, known as the Preservers. For many years, Epimetheus trained recruits, and by the time he ventured into the real world, he was already an experienced warrior with a great history. According to ancient scrolls, Epimetheus and his brotherhood took part in the Great Purge. Moreover, Epimetheus himself claimed that the Great Purge lasted several centuries. After numerous successful missions, Epimetheus volunteered to guard the Damnation Cache on the world of Pythos Death, where he spent 10,000 years in stasis. At some point, Abaddon arrived on Pythos to open the cache. In honor of such an event, Epimetheus awoke and fought the Chaos forces, alongside a junior inquisitor of the Ordo Malaeus and the Imperial forces. In the end, Abaddon captured Epimetheus to experiment with his gene seed. What happened to him afterward is unknown. But the Grey Knights do not surrender easily. Another of the seven was Fel Jarost, a former librarian of the Night Lords, who later took the pseudonym Chiron and led the Eighth Brotherhood of the Grey Knights. Interestingly, Jarost was born on Terra, in a prison mine under Albia. Understandably, he was particularly sensitive to changes in the Legion when the Night Lords reunited with their Primarch and began recruiting new members on Nostramo. The inhabitants of Nostramo were distinguished by their enjoyment of killing for pleasure. It was in their nature. But Fel Jarost was against it. 
By the time of the Council of Nicaea, there were not so many Terrans left in the Legion, and it was decided to part ways with the Librarians. Jarost met with Sevatar to find out what would happen next for people like him. He was too persistent, and Sevatar was too indifferent to Librarians, so much so that he even struck Fell, knocking him to the ground, threatening him with red gloves if he did not obey. Jarost flew into a rage and began to direct psychic forces at Sevatar, screaming that people like him had corrupted the Legion. He did not expect that Sevatar could fend off his attacks. That day, Jarost was not killed. Sevatar simply ordered him to run away and never return. Jarost returned to his home under Albia and hid there until the agents of the Sigilite found him when the Horus heresy had already begun. Jarost, as you can understand, decided to join the Wandering Knights and as a trial had to kill the librarian Vathras Kel, who was performing a chaos ritual on the world Maleknar, where Jarost went along with Mesa Varan and another Wandering Knight. Of course, he completed his mission and later renounced his past name, taking a new one, Chiron, and led the Eighth Brotherhood of the Grey Knights, also known as the Silverblades. Now the remains of Chiron are kept in the Tomb of the Eight. Another Grand Master of the Grey Knights became Chiron, formerly known as Tylos Rubio. I think you all are well acquainted with this Ultramarines librarian whom Nathaniel Garrow first took into the Knights Errant. Tylos was a psyker of immense power, and despite his outrage at the Council of Nikia, he surrendered his psychic hood and force sword, and returned to the ranks as a mere battle brother, vowing not to use his psychic powers. On Kalth, he was among those who sensed the approach of the word-bearers, but, clearly remembering the edict, he told no one, and since then, Rubio has regretted this decision. Ultimately, the entire 21st Company was almost completely destroyed, and during the fierce battle, Nathaniel Garrow, who had flown across half the galaxy, found Tylos. He informed Tylos that he must appear on terror by the order of Malkador. Tylos refused, and Garrow had to not fly away, but fight alongside him. And ultimately, during the fierce battle to save his brothers, he directed his psychic powers at the enemies. But he suddenly gained the distrust of his brothers, for he had effectively violated the Emperor's decree. At that moment, Rubio realized he could no longer be an ultramarine. He swore allegiance to Garo and went with him to Terra. Upon arrival, Tylos was given a new psychic hood and weapons and was allowed to use his psychic abilities. He participated in the operations of the Knights Errant for quite a long time. During the Siege of Terror, Malkador explained to Tylos that he now had to renounce his past and accept a new identity, becoming the Grand Master of a new ultra-secret order. Thus Tylos became Chiron. Another first Grand Master of the Grey Knights was called Ogun. With him, it's much more complicated, for no one knows who he really was in life. Most likely, he was one of the Raven Guard. There are even several possibilities. Balsa Kuturi or Antaka Chivan. Balsar was a librarian of the Raven Guard during the Great Crusade. Horus often went mad and didn't trust his librarians. At one point he even disbanded them, stating that they all had to go to Terra. Balsar long persuaded the Primarch to keep the librarians in the Legion, but not to use their powers. Corvus insisted on all these statements that Balsar must fly to Malkador and let him decide what will be with him. Kuturi went to Terra, accompanied by the Imperial Fists, led by Captain Nuriz and the Adeptus Custodes. Nuriz tried to help him, but in the end, he was killed. The second likely Ogun named Antaka Chivan was also a librarian of the Raven Guard, and was engaged in hunting for the Shards of Magnus. Less is known about this librarian, but he is also a likely candidate for the role of Ogun. The next Grand Master of the Grey Knights became Satra, also known as Vardas Ison, a librarian of the Blood Angels, who for some reason hated his legion and most likely Sanguinius. He hid his origins but was discovered by Mesa Varan. Vardas fought side by side with Nathaniel Garrow, Tylos Rubio and Varan against cultists on Terra. After the battle with Nurgle, it became clear that he was well suited to be a Grand Master of the Grey Knights, and Vardas took the new name Satra, becoming one of the Grand Masters. Next in line is Severian, the Grand Master of the Grey Knights. 
Once, Severian was a member of the Crusader Host, which was created to protect Terra. The Crusader Host united members from different legions. Since there was particularly nothing to protect on Terra in those years, the Crusaders kept the names of all the legionaries who had given their lives for the Imperium. Severian was one of the Lunar Wolves, and so, when the Horus Heresy began, he was imprisoned with Kangba Malwu along with other members of the Crusader host. This happened just as Magnus was telegraphing through the warp. Atharva from the Thousand Suns eventually freed Severian and his forces. He wanted to present the Emperor with evidence that Horus was a traitor. It all ended badly. The Imperial forces tracked them down, and Severian's brothers were killed. Severian himself hid for a long time, pursued by the tracker Nagasena who let him live. Eventually the Sigilite took in both Severian and Yasu and incorporated them into his cause. Severian, along with the travelling knights, infiltrated Horus's battleship to install guidance beacons for the Space Wolves' attack. Later, he too was chosen by Malkador to found the Grey Knights, taking the name Yapta and also becoming a Grand Master. Who's next? Fyodor Stromgren. Originally, Fyodor was a rune priest of the Space Wolves and was assigned to watch over Conrad Kurz during the Horus Heresy. Kurz captured Fyodor and his pack and killed them all, severely mutilating Fyodor and sending him to terror. The wandering knights found Fyodor's body, and Malkador demanded the brave warrior be resurrected, not as a dreadnought, but as a whole fighter. As you understand, the Imperium possesses the most powerful technologies for such cases, and they really got him back on his feet after which he was made a wandering knight and later a Grand Master of the Grey Knights. Jotun or Jotun. As you know, the Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights became Janus, also known as Revuel Arvida. He was one of the few thousand sons who did not follow his Primarch. Instead, he helped the White Scars reach terror using a special throne. Interestingly, Revuel Arvida was afflicted with the Curse of the Flesh Change and by the time the White Scars reached Terra, had transformed into something indescribable. He was immediately taken to a special laboratory of Malkador the Sigilite, where Malkador saved his life by merging his body with a shard of Magnus's soul. Yes, Magnus was shattered into many fragments when he tried to warn the Emperor through the warp that Horus had betrayed him. In essence, Magnus partially, literally, became the head of the Grey Knight's Brotherhood. All information about Janus is highly classified. It is unknown whether he is alive or dead in the 41st millennium, but the chance is great. It would be interesting if the Grey Knights eventually found their own Primarch, but for now, it's just a fantasy. Janus, Epimetheus, Hiron, Chios, Ogun, Yapta, Jotun, and Satra were the first among the Grey Knights to be personally approved by the Emperor at their meeting. It was they who went to Titan, Saturn's moon, to lay the foundations of the new order. Twelve chosen ones emerged from the besieged Emperor's palace through secret passages, after which they split up. Eight marines were taken by Regan with him, while four local nobles were to lay the foundation of the structure known as the Inquisition. Titan, by the way, was hidden from prying eyes by the sorcerous charms of Malkador. The moon ceased to exist. And since everyone was occupied with the Siege of Terror, no one even thought to consider it. Who knows what happened to it? Maybe the traitors blew it up. In reality, a fortress monastery was built there, within whose walls everything was stored to create a new army of space marines. Hundreds of thousands of secretly selected recruits were already in place, and the storages contained a huge amount of gene seed, which, by the way, was not just any seed. For the Grey Knights, a special gene seed was created, containing the so-called Gift of the Emperor, which includes particles of his soul and flesh, and has no flaws. After its implantation, the warrior becomes a real demon-killing machine, also pure in soul, and not susceptible to the corruption of chaos. There was no talk of a legion. The plan was only to create an order of a thousand warriors, and hundreds of thousands of recruits were needed for clear reasons. As usually, 99% of neophytes perished during training or the implantation of gene seed. The servants of Malkador meticulously selected new recruits for the order, studied their minds, and looked for any hint of corruption. 100,000 recruits were psychers or hidden psychers. 
To find them, Malkador's servants searched hundreds of thousands of planets. Some were recruited from the worlds of legions, some from the Imperial Army, and some even from primitive worlds that had only recently seen the light of the Emperor. These warriors were the most resilient, and were even unaware of Horus's heresy. This was very convenient. When the eight Chosen Ones reached Titan, Malkador the Sigilite cast another powerful spell that removed Titan from orbit and hid it within the warp. To prevent demons from intruding, Titan was protected by the most powerful Geller field generators and Sigilite runes. So why didn't the demons see the planet of Psychers in the warp? The thing is, all the Chosen Ones were so sinless that their psychic power was poisonous to all entities in the warp. Titan eventually returned to its former orbit during the second founding. The fact is that time flows differently in the warp. While years passed in the Imperium, decades passed on Titan, and the Grey Knights trained a thousand battle brothers and managed to establish the workings of the Fortress Monastery. By the time of their return to the Imperium, the Inquisition, which was led by those same four nobles chosen by the Emperor and Malkador, had already appeared. They all understood perfectly well and calmly included the Grey Knights in the list of new Space Marine chapters under number 666, even though there were fewer than 400 chapters at that time. As you may realise, the Grey Knights initially worked with the Inquisition. As soon as Titan appeared in the real world, the Lords of the Inquisition immediately flew to the moon and met with the Supreme Grandmaster Janus to conclude a certain treaty the information about which is sealed in the most secret vaults of Titan. Already after their arrival in the real world, the Grey Knights were necessary for the Imperium. Demonic invasions were constantly occurring, tormenting people across different ends of the galaxy. The Demon Hunters waged their war wherever there was a hint of chaos invasion or a threat from the Dark Gods. The four founders of the Inquisition lived quite long, Chiral Sinderman, who became Inquisitor Lastanni Magian Veritas, lived for one and a half thousand years until the end of the War of the Beast in the 32nd millennium. He confessed to his fellow Inquisitor Venon that he was one of the original four Inquisitors gathered by Malkador. It was he who ordered the Grey Knights to smash the forces of chaos after the Horus heresy. The other original Inquisitors were dead, so only he knew about the order. The Grey Knights did not participate in the War of the Beast. They had plenty of other matters to deal with. Kirill Sinderman passed Venant a special chip that allowed access to Titan, so that she could meet with Janus and discuss dividing the Inquisition into Ordos. Centuries later, the Grey Knights became the official military arm of the Ordo Malleus and began participating in their military campaigns. They managed fine without them before that. A core feature of all Grey Knights is that they are powerful psychers. Each of them can use protective charms as well as special armor aegis. Moreover, they are entirely immune to warp corruption. This gift from the Emperor is passed down from generation to generation. Therefore, all Grey Knights can use desecrated artifacts or read heretical books without any harm to their mental health. Among the Grey Knights, there are truly mighty psychers. Their powers are so great that they cannot be contained. If it were a regular Psyker, he would immediately attract the attention of demons. But the stronger a Grey Knight Psyker, the more painful it is for the demons. Grey Knights do not bear their real names. This is necessary to sever the warrior's connection with his past life, although he does not remember his past anyway, as their memory is erased during training. A Grey Knight receives a new name only after joining the chapter. Until that moment, he goes by a code number. His new name becomes a word obtained by the chapter's scribes through studying volumes of psychic knowledge. Often, it is an anagram of the real name of some demon. The names of the Sons of Titan change periodically. Usually this happens if a demon related to that name constantly reincarnates from the warp. The creatures of the Emperors recoil in horror upon hearing the name of the Grey Knight they are battling. The chapter of the Grey Knights is divided into military units called Brotherhoods. Each Brotherhood is akin to a combat company of a standard chapter of Space Marines. There are a total of eight Brotherhoods. Each includes approximately 100 Space Marines, not counting the Brother Captain and the Grand Master. The First Brotherhood, the Swordbearers, is famed for its pilots. 
It is to them that the other brotherhoods turn when they need the aid of land raiders and storm ravens. The Grand Master of the First Brotherhood also bears the title of Master of the Arsenal, and his subordinates constantly maintain and repair the equipment of the Grey Knights. To ensure the machinery is always battle-ready, the Grand Master of the First Brotherhood personally oversees the sacred machines and the tech space marines who tend to them. The current head of the First Brotherhood is Grand Master Varden Kai. The Second Brotherhood is named the Blades of Victory. All its warriors are masters of swift strikes and rapid deployment on the battlefield. They are indeed faster than the other Grey Knights. The ranks of the Second Brotherhood include many strike squads and interceptors, who are massively teleported into the enemy's rear and annihilate it instantaneously. The remaining warriors often fight in the vanguard of the Grey Knight's forces. The Grand Master of the Second Brotherhood, who is, by the way, called Vort Mordrak, also serves as the Admiral of the Grey Knight's fleet. Therefore, the Blades of Victory always arrive on the battlefield in time, and sometimes thanks to the prognosticators even beforehand. The Third Brotherhood is named the Wardmakers, and it enjoys great respect among the other brotherhoods. According to legends, it was once led by the Supreme Grandmaster Janus, and even after him many heroes served there, say, your favourite, Kaldor Drago. He began his path as a simple warrior, then rose to the rank of Brother Captain and to Grand Master of the Third Brotherhood. Now the third is commanded by another hero, Arvan Stern. The third is strong with its librarians. All novices are trained in unique methods of psychic influence, meaning all Grey Knights are essentially psychers, but the librarians are even more formidable than ordinary psychers. The Fourth Brotherhood, the prescient brethren, preserve the Augurium. The Grand Master of the Fourth, Dreisten Krom, bears the title of Keeper and oversees the training of new prognosticators. It is the warriors of the Fourth who later replenish their ranks if, say, they were wounded on the battlefield. For the Grey Knights, the process is simpler. You're only entombed in a dreadnought in extreme cases and retirement is not an option. You will be a prognosticator, scouting the warp and predicting the future. Such individuals are needed by the Grey Knights to know in advance where a particular demon will appear. This also helps on the battlefield. If you can occasionally predict strikes, it becomes easier to fight demons. The Fifth Brotherhood, the Preservers, is responsible for the gene seed of the Grey Knights. Here, apothecaries are trained, who not only deal with the collection of gene seed and treating the wounded, but also oversee the dreadnoughts, which, of course, the Grey Knights also possess. And, as you understand, they are all part of the Fifth Brotherhood. The Grand Master of the Fifth, is the defender of the Sanctum Sanctorum. Currently, it is Rothweir Morvans. The Sixth Brotherhood, the Rapiers, is also aptly named. Its knights prefer to deliver precise surgical strikes on the enemy without using artillery barrages and orbital bombardments. However, they often use a multitude of servitors in battle, which distract the enemy on the battlefield. You understand that losses among the Grey Knights must be minimized as there are very few of them and the rapiers excel at this task. Anval Laron is the Grand Master of the Sixth. Since the Grey Knights collaborate with the Ordo Malleus, there is a brotherhood within the Order responsible for this cooperation. Specifically, it is the Seventh Brotherhood, the Exactors. Kovan Leorak, a representative of the Grey Knights in the Inquisition, is the Grand Master of the Seventh Brotherhood. This Brotherhood receives all information about the demonic threat directly from the agents of the Inquisition across the entire Imperium. And if needed, they receive auxiliary troops. This Brotherhood often fights alongside the Imperial Guard, requisitioned by agents from Terror. Those brave warriors who survive collaboration with the Seventh Brotherhood undergo brainwashing and are turned into servitors as a sign of gratitude for their service. The Eighth Brotherhood known as the Silver Blades, deals with novices. As soon as a neophyte passes the initiation rite, he immediately joins the Eighth Brotherhood. Later, he may go elsewhere, depending on what he is capable of and what he does. Some neophytes remain in the Eighth Brotherhood and dedicate their lives to continuous training, aiming for perfection in everything. Aidan Perdron is the Grand Master of the Eighth and is responsible for the training of knight recruits. 
Besides the Brotherhood of Grey Knights, there are several important formations, specifically Purifiers and Paladins. The Purifiers are located in the Halls of Purity, which are hidden deep beneath the Fortress Monastery at the entrance to the ancient dungeons of Mount Anak, within which some ancient evil lurks. It is the Purifiers who guard it. One cannot enter the Halls of Purity without an invitation. Many attempt it, especially neophytes, who see it as a kind of test, but as soon as they approach their coveted goal, they immediately receive a reprimand from the guards. After that, they don't even think about attempting it again, as some never return from there. The only ones who can enter the halls are the Grand Masters of the Order. The Purifiers embody loyalty to the Order and its sacred goal. Their eyes are filled with fanaticism, burning with a dark flame that shows that these men can move mountains. The most interesting thing is that there are no trials to become a Purifier. You could be loyal to the Emperor for two hundred years and be the strongest, and they still wouldn't accept you. They only recruit newcomers if they are 250% sure that his soul is absolutely pure. The selection process is so thorough that they have never been particularly numerous. This ultra-pure soul is a formidable weapon that, together with the psychic powers of the Grey Knights, can turn into azure flame and scorch the enemy's soul in addition to their body. Castellan Garen Crow, the one with the demonic blade Antwer, which constantly whispers directly into his brain, promises of glory. Not everyone can handle such a weapon, but Garen Crow copes with this task brilliantly. Another important formation of the Grey Knights are the Paladins. These are the most elite warriors of the Grey Knights chapter. To become a Paladin, a Space Marine must complete eight tasks to determine whether he is worthy of such a title at all, and to temper his character in the process. During the first trial, the candidate spends a day and night in the caves beneath Mount Anarch. The caves are a terrifying and dangerous place, easy to lose one's mind. If successful and he retains his sanity, he must then test his will against the unslumbering evil from the dire tome of Abella, chained in the chapter's Sanctum Sanctorum. This tests the strength of spirit and skill in weapon handling. Following this, the candidate makes a pilgrimage to the tomb of Lancel on the cursed moon of Titus. He does this without armor or amulets that would protect him from warp affliction. The candidate must find and destroy four types of demonic heralds of chaos, then bring back a rock or fang as proof. On Titus, there are many different challenging tests for paladins. For example, a candidate must capture and banish to the Immaterium one of the 666 mighty demons, armed only with a nemesis psychic sword. Knowing, however, the monster's true name written on the pages of the Iron Grimoire, the Order's most complete collection of all its secrets. Once all these trials are passed, the candidate is accepted into the ranks of the Paladins. As you can understand, not everyone passes these trials, but very few have ever refused to continue during the process, as refusal is considered a disgrace. In honor of the new Paladins, a triumphant feast is organized, after which the new Paladin leaves his brotherhood and takes his place in the Sacred Hall. Paladins also serve as personal guards to the Grand Masters and as apothecaries, who are very important for the Chapter of Grey Knights, because the gene seed is very rare. The Chapter of Grey Knights is governed by a council. At the table sit eight Grand Masters and the Chapter Master, who is traditionally called the Supreme Grand Master. This tradition was established by Malkador the Sigilite. Understandably, the Supreme Grand Master has the final say in discussions, but the word of every Grand Master matters to prevent a psychopath from seizing power in the chapter, like Goj van Dira, for example, did. The most famous Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights before the discovery of the Cicatrix Maledictum, Kaldor Drago, became famous for many different deeds. To summarize, he's the local Doom Guy, cursed by the demon Makar and taken with him into the warp. But Kaldor Drago didn't lose his cool and started burning squads of Nurgle, killing all demons he saw. Moreover, the demons themselves aren't happy that someone brought him into their world. But Kaldor Drago still continues his eternal battle. He had one chance left, the last chance before death. 
Drago clenched Mortarion's massive armoured gauntlet with an iron grip and released all of his psychic energy to the last drop. Burn for your sins before the immortal gaze of the Emperor God, he gasped. Sacred flame ignited in Drago's hands and leapt onto the Primarch's forearm. The gathering storm fanned it. It jumped onto the dry clothes that clung to the mighty bodies of the demon princes and the fire blazed into a fierce inferno. Mortarion turned into a huge funeral pyre. He writhed and howled in searing pain, but still firmly grasped Drago's helmet. Treason! Sorcery! His pain-filled scream resonated. The hood vanished, burned away. Flakes of blackened fabric flew off, revealing a grey crown with streaks. For the first time, Drago saw the eyes of the demon prince beneath hairless brows. Though they were painfully malicious and glowed with hate, they were surprisingly human. Everything faded again and quieted down, as if concussed. Before Mortarion could utter another word, Drago turned inward and hurled the unspoken truth of the true name through the Primarch's mental defences. It struck like a needle and disappeared. Mortarion's grip weakened. One bloodshot eye twitched. The giant war scythe fell to the ground, and from the respirator mask, the demon prince's scream was heard. It was a soul-shattering, agonizing scream full of pain, which hurled the nearest demonic minions away, and some were simply cast out of reality in clouds of noxious vapor. For a few seconds, dim light shone through the flames from the cracks in the armor, and then Mortarion, the Lord of Death and the Pale King, exploded. Kaldor Drago inflicted a powerful insult on Mortarion. Mortarion retreated into the warp and swore revenge on the insolent Drago, but has yet to exact his vengeance. Drago hampered not only Mortarion, but also the demon Makar, who once trapped him and, of course, did not succeed. But with his last strength, grabbed Drago and dragged him into a warp rift from which he drew strength. There's an interesting story of their confrontation, indeed. The first time he banished Makar from the real world, he cursed him and declared that he was doomed to wander many years through the warp if they met again. And now, during this trap, his prophecy came true. But this is Kaldor Drago. The power of the warp, which would drive a mere human and even a space marine insane, had no dominion over him. His mind was tempered and resisted temptations, so it soon became apparent that he was in the warp for the long haul, and something had to be done about it. At first, he simply wandered through the realm of chaos, killing demons of all sorts and sizes which tried to destroy or seduce him. Climbing to the top of a huge waterfall of blood, which was, incidentally, the blood of the slain champions of Khorne, Drago killed the bloodthirster Carvoth. Do I need to tell you about bloodthirsters? They are the highest demons of Khorne. Drago killed him on his own territory. These demons drop excellent loot, and Drago acquired a battle axe. He split it and used it to reforge into the Nemesis Sword. Having restored his equipment, he continued to wreak havoc on the unholy. You think only the slaves of Khorne suffered? No. After that, Drago went on a rampage and set fire to the gardens of Nurgle. After that, for a long time, the winds of the Realm of Chaos carried the smell of burning, rotten vegetation to the surroundings. Next in line were the demons of Slanesh, who tried to tempt Drago with promises of glory, wealth and love. Fulgrim might have easily fallen for this, but not Kaldor Drago. He didn't care. He broke through their forces and moved on, towards the greater demon of Zinch, the Lord of Change with one thousand schemes. Also, a rather cunning specimen that constantly puts obstacles in the path of the Grey Knights. He had an offer for Drago to return him home. In truth, I suspect they were so tired of him there that they would gladly get rid of him. But Drago realized he could have a great time here and just killed the Lord of Change with one thousand schemes. Later, it turned out that Kaldor Drago could indeed return to reality. Once, a heretic known as the Prophet Jaster made a deal with the greater demon of Slanesh Nakari, who pulled part of the Chaos Realm into the mortal world. Kaldor Drago noticed this and sneaked in amid the Chaos, briefly joining forces with his order, which had just arrived to kill Nakari. Gathering their strength, they really beat him up. Then the warp gates closed, and Kaldor Drago was sucked back into the Realm of Chaos. Since then, 
He periodically appears in the real world and aids the Grey Knights before leaving again. So, if you ever meet him on the battlefield, don't worry. It's supposed to be this way. As there have been more rifts in the warp across the galaxy, Drago started to appear in the real world more and more often. Many speculate on how this will all end, whether it will be the Great Warrior's return to the side of good or his complete disappearance. But with Drago, it's the same situation as with Lehman Russ, Vulcan and the others. In the hour of great need, he will surely appear. We couldn't do without him. Let's shift focus from the heroes and talk about the equipment the Grey Knights use in battle. They have a lot of interesting stuff. It's no wonder they are such a progressive order. The weaponry of the Grey Knights is among the most advanced in the Imperium. I'm not sure if that's still the case after the arrival of Belisarius' call, but for now, they have a lot to boast about. Primarily, of course, is the whole series of Nemesis weapons, which are specially created for the Order by the Adeptus Mechanicus. Nemesis is a psycho-power weapon that instantly attunes to the mind of the bearer, allowing them to focus the warp energy in the blade. As you understand, Nemesis hurts demons considerably. The stronger the Psyker, the better they cut through bodies and armor with pure energy and, say, call forth fire by focusing warp energy. Every Grey Knight has a Nemesis weapon, but some may be weaker. But eventually the weapon also levels up along with its owner. The most powerful psychokinetic weapon, of course, belongs to Kaldor Drago. I'm talking about the Titan Sword, in case you're wondering. Rumor has it that the Emperor himself forged it, and eventually passed it on to Janus through Malkador the Sigilite as an artifact. Yes, it was wielded by the first Supreme Grand Master, and he smote demons with it left and right. Every sword, halberd, or nemesis falchion is made from rare psycho-resonating materials. No one knows where they are sourced, but it's a situation similar to the crystals. Before a crystal is added to the blade, it is ceremonially blessed on the cardinal world of Ophelia IV, and specifically attuned for a particular user. It's interesting that, for instance, some halberds can only be wielded by their owner, or at least directed in them with power. The Grey Knight's arsenal also includes small nemesis falchion swords, which are usually used in pairs, very useful when you need to chop someone down. And, of course, one can't forget about the Nemesis Force Sword, the most widespread weapon in the Order. Its blade is forged from tempered iron and inlaid with inserts of silver shards and ancient runes against demons. Also, at the heart of the sword is an upgraded version of a refractor field generator, as in the Falcons, actually. The Grey Knights also have a hammer and Nemesis. There's not much more to add here. A large two-handed one with a head similar to a regular thunder hammer, only this one can be psychically charged. It is, by the way, used by the Ordo Malleus Inquisitors, clad in power armor. Also, a Nemesis Doomfist can be equipped on a Grey Knight's Dreadnought, which splendidly spices up the bloody battles with demons for the ancient Dreadnoughts. In the Order of the Grey Knights, they are also fond of ranged bolter weaponry, in particular storm bolters. They fire 75 caliber bolts, excellently ripping through enemies. Sometimes they fire psi bolts, which inflict additional damage. Heavy weaponry is also present among the Grey Knights. Say, the Silencer, which doesn't even use ammunition. It shoots pulses of psychic energy. Each shooter must concentrate a necessary amount of psychic power and hold it in the core of the weapon, after which this energy is directed through a psychic crystal and hits the enemy. The Psy Cannon, for instance, fires bolts, but they're psychically charged using anti-grav suspensors, which reduce the weight of these bolts, allowing one to shoot on the move, a very powerful weapon against all types of armor. The Grey Knights also have a trendy version of the flamethrower, known as the Incinerator. A heavy flamethrower, which shoots bullets mixed with blessed oils and amplified by psychic power. All Grey Knights are equipped with special power armor model Aegis. On the outside, it's the same armor of the Space Marines, but inside it hides many technological secrets. Plus, it's created from the best ceramite adamantium and the most fashionable of available alloys. It's important that the armor contains a network of crystalline fibers, which form a special psychomatrix called the Aegis, hence its name. The armor of the Grey Knights is covered with protective charms and ritual inscriptions that amplify the psychic strength of the owner. Every Grey Knight carries with him a copy of the sacred book, Liber Demonicum, right in the chestplate. 
He receives a copy after completing his training. The original holds incredible power and is kept in the fortress monastery on Titan. The Liber de Monica contains all the beliefs and duties of the Order, as well as combat rights against demons and demon worshippers. To make it easier to kill demons, a Grey Knight uses the Codicium Immaternum, which contains all the knowledge of the Grey Knights and the Ordo Malleus, about the thousands of different demons the Imperium has ever encountered. How to kill them and how to capture them is described in this book. Generally, the units of the Grey Knights are similar to the units of other Adeptus Astartes orders. For example, the order has chaplains, librarians and regular infantry in the form of strike squads. But there are some differences. For instance, interceptors who use portable teleporters on the battlefield. They literally travel through the warp without a Geller field. Only Grey Knights can afford such a thing. The purgation squads are responsible for the combat power and all the most intense weaponry in the order. Each squad of five warriors brings up to four types of heavy weapons into battle. Yes, essentially these are Astartes Devastators, only more powerful because they're psychers. The most fashionable and exclusive feature of the Grey Knights is the Nemesis Dread Knight. It's an exoskeleton made of adamantium alloy and ceramite plates, which is moved by a powerful and compact plasma reactor. The Grey Knights directly secure themselves onto the machine's abdomen, where through synaptic implants they gain full control over the Dread Knight. The exoskeleton boasts crushing firepower, including enhanced silencers and psychanons, and of course, the great psychic weapon, the Nemesis. No one knows how the Grey Knights got this machine. The development is from the Dark Age of Technology. Or maybe they made some deal with the Xenos. This is totally normal for the Grey Knights, by the way. But the machine is really deadly, even though it would raise questions on Mars. However, the Grey Knights only answer to the Inquisition. So there are no questions from Mars. Of course, the Order would like everyone to have exoskeletons. But few can operate this machine. You need really quick reactions and strong psychic power. So, if you're a Dread Knight pilot, you're truly respected by everyone. But the coolest are, of course, the Grand Masters in the Nemesis Dread Knight. These are simply unmatched in coolness. Candidates for the Grey Knights are still being recruited in quite large numbers, but not from any one world. The Order's recruiters travel across the galaxy and pick suitable young men after which they direct them to the testing chambers. 99% die. The recruiters, by the way, are also members of the Order, who for some reason did not become knights. It's interesting that neophytes are primarily recruited from primitive and barbaric worlds because their inhabitants are very resilient, but they also don't mind taking a peek at the black ship in search for psychers. Sometimes recruits are sent to the Grey Knights by the Order's affiliates, say, exorcists, who are called the Second Grey Knights. But of course, that's not really the case. Generally speaking, the trial process is ongoing. Ships approach the trial chambers to bring in novices or to take away bodies. I will tell you more about Titan, where, in fact, the fortress monastery of the Grey Knights is located, standing in the shadow of Mount Anak, surrounded by oceans of liquid methane and shards of ice, as it is described. The monastery houses a great number of Grey Knights, servitors, servants, and other useful individuals. And, of course, many different buildings, each serves a specific purpose. The core activity of the Grey Knights is the Augurium, a black spire at the top of the monastery fortress. Inside its walls, the Order's prognosticators conduct their rituals. These powerful psychers can catch even the smallest fluctuations in the warp to predict where demons plan to invade. When fighting the forces of the Immaterium, they are simply indispensable because, thanks to their work, the Grey Knights can fully prepare for battle. All new recruits of the Order end up in the trial chambers where they are understandably put through very harsh tests and only a small part of them eventually becomes Grey Knights. The most important thing for them is to go through the halls of bioengineering and psychosurgery, where servitors work on their bodies. No one in these places will hear your cry. The most important test for the Grey Knights is the ritual of detestation, which is designed to strengthen the soul and heart against the whisper of chaos and false demons. To pass it, one must possess an unblemished soul. The Hall of Champions serves as the home for the finest warriors of the Grey Knights known as Paladins. 
Along its walls stand huge stone statues of the heroes of the past. Brother captains, grandmasters, who have been immortalized in stone as examples for new generations. Also, this hall contains many trophy weapons, artifacts and armors. Some of them are of demonic nature, but the most dangerous ones are in the chambers of purity, of course. Mainly, trophies from the killing of various demonic heretics hang there. The most famous artifact is the charred skull of Raja Nalu, such a demon who once caused trouble for the Grey Knights in the city of Uli'ib. He was wounded, and ever since the spirit of the demon is contained within his own skull, which hangs above the assembly of Grandmasters. It's held in place by the constant chanting of three acolytes who ensure the integrity of the magic cage. For hundreds of years, it has watched as the Grey Knights feasted, locked within its own skull. The heart of the Grey Knights Order is the holiest of holies, the Sanctum Sanctorum, and it's not Doctor Strange who lives there. This place contains knowledge that has been accumulated by the Order for millennia. Even the Emperor has some secret information. Right here lies all the information on nemesis weapons and dreadnoughts, as well as various rituals and spellcasting knowledge, but most importantly, the original Liber Demonica, a collection of all knowledge about demons and the warp collected over thousands of years is kept in the Sanctum Sanctorum. Moreover, within this holiest of holies, there is a vast library. Its shelves are filled with ancient scrolls, warp volumes and ancient data crystals. Lines of shuffling, hunchbacked servitors assist the librarians. Their lobotomized brains are wiped and reprogrammed at the end and beginning of each day. It is hidden behind three doors made of adamantium, each several meters thick, concealed with spells in ancient and lost languages, and smeared with blessed oils covered with silver seal wards. Behind each of the doors, something enticing awaits. The first say is sealed with a cipher lock, with an almost infinite number of combinations and can withstand a continuous barrage of weaponry. The second portal contains a field of spatial displacement, an artifact from the dark age of technology that warps space. No matter how fast or where you run, you will always end up back where you started. The last door is a magical vortex, a defense against psychers and demons. For all psychoactive beings, the Vortex can rip out the soul if the correct words are not spoken. It guards the entrance to the Supreme Library. If one errs in opening even one of the library doors, everything will be destroyed, along with those attempting to enter. Upon closer inspection, one can find a stasis arc within the Sanctum Sanctorum. Within it are multiple levels with tesseract labyrinths created by the Necrons and designed for imprisoning pure energy beings. Essentially, it's a perfect prison for demons, who utterly despise such confinement. That is, should a demon be killed, it can at least return to the warp, to later create a new body for itself. Inside the Tesseract Labyrinth, a demon is forever isolated from the warp. Sometimes demons are released by the Order Malleus Inquisitors for interrogation, and there is much to interrogate. There are thousands of cubes at different levels though creating a demon of your own is not easy. A Grey Knight must defeat a demon without destroying its body. Therefore, almost all captured demons are lesser beings. Only once in history have the Grey Knights captured a greater demon, losing many warriors in the process. But if this happened, it means there is hope. However, there are not many Tesseract cubes left, as the Grey Knights have lost the secrets of their production. Currently, many in the Order believe that the cubes were created by magic and are operated with standard rituals and chants. In short, the stockpile of Tesseract labyrinths is running out, and most likely the Grey Knights will not have any new ones, because they are no longer allies with the race that provided them with those resources for obvious reasons. At the very heart of the Grey Knight's Monastery Fortress lies the Warp Nexus Star Chambers, where the air itself crackles with the incredible psychic energies fueled by the constant prayers and chants of 200 Order Servants. It was the Warp Nexus that protected Titan from the Warp's flow when Malkador the Sigilite hid it from the gaze of the Imperium. Time has passed since then, and now it's the Warp Nexus itself that has to be protected being essentially an artifact of the Dark Age of Technology, bequeathed to the Order by Malkador the Sigilite. 
The warp nexus can still hide Titan in the warp if sudden protection is required. After their death, each Grey Knight is laid to rest in an illuminated crypt on the fields of death. Here lie the heroes of the Order's very foundation, so the crypt walls are adorned with bas-reliefs depicting their heroic deeds, illuminated by a blue flame. Sometimes it's impossible to save the body, so heroes are engraved onto the Great Basalt Memory Wall to immortalize them alongside other fallen heroes of the Order. Every hero whose name is inscribed on the Great Basalt Memory Wall died under the most terrible circumstances, battling the spawns of chaos. The Grey Knights have a room where neophytes practice the art of close combat, so valued by the Order. Meetings with the Inquisitors of the Ordo Maleus are often held there as well. It's called the Chamber of the Fallen Dagger, and this is not without reason. Many years ago, Calgan Grasscutter challenged his wards to a knife duel without armor, putting his state-of-the-art Terminator armor at stake for whoever could defeat him. No one ever did, and Calgan was eventually buried with his dagger in the Crypt of Titan. And the chamber still operates to this day. In the depths of the Grey Knight's Monastery Fortress, are the Purity Chambers, the base of the Order of Purifiers, which, as I previously mentioned, is off-limits to anyone but the Grand Masters. The Purity Chambers contain the most powerful demonic artifacts and relics, possessed by demons, all the most dangerous items that the Grey Knights find in their battles and cannot use without tainting their souls, are ultimately sent there. Only the powerful psychic will of the purifiers holds the demons within the artifacts at bay. Though there is another theory about this place, claiming that when Malkador hid Titan in the warp, something breached its defense and landed on the moon. This is documented in the only recorded history of the order known as the Iron Grimoire, written in the blood of saints and encased in metal tempered by the warp. Only the Supreme Grand Master may read the book, claiming that an ancient evil still lies hidden in the mountain of Anak, guarded by the purifiers. There's also a rumor that it was sealed there by the Emperor of Mankind before the Great Crusade. But no one knows for sure. Also in the purity chambers is a room where a wooden casket adorned with a golden seal is stored. Inside lies what is known as the Terminus Decree, or Decree Terminus. Only the Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights knows of the existence of this artifact. The decree can only be unsealed at humanity's darkest hour, when all hope is lost. It is said that the Terminus Decree could either save humanity or utterly destroy it. Interestingly, Kaldor Drago is already discussing the advisability of using the decree with other Grand Masters after the discovery of the Great Rift. That's how bad things are for the Imperium right now. There are many speculations on this subject, but only a couple are the sanest. Let's say that the decree will stop the ancient mechanisms of the Golden Throne and allow the Emperor to be reborn, because the Golden Seal on the box is only on the throne of the Emperor of Mankind. Such coincidences cannot be accidental. There is also another plausible theory. The thing is, information about the Terminus Decree was telepathically transmitted by Malkador the Sigilite to one of his chosen, Halid Hassan, so that he could continue his work. It seems that the Terminus Project is a weapon capable of killing all the Astartes, developed by the mad scientist Basilio Fo. During the Dark Age of Technology, he created various monsters on Terra. When the Emperor came to power, he flew from Terra and settled on a remote planet, where he continued his experiments until Horus found him and sent him to prison on Terra. Basilio Fo had formidable monsters, and he himself was not to be underestimated. Horus introduced the idea that Fo was a traitor creating monsters, to which Fo retorted that it was the Emperor who had created the most terrible monsters and he did not want to live in the same galaxy with such beings as the Primarchs and Space Marines, and that Horus was the most disgusting and grotesque creature, a true freak. He claimed he wanted to kill Horus and all the Space Marines. Fo was interrogated for a long time on Terra. Fo claimed he could create a virus that would kill both the Space Marines and the Primarchs. So, this theory seems to be true. In space, Titan guards the huge bastion Apex Cronus, the size of a small moon. It is considered one of the most powerful fortresses of the Imperium. 
there is an unverified rumor that its power even surpasses that of the Imperial Fist's phalanx. In fact, Titan is surrounded by numerous orbital defense platforms. For example, Palash Station, which also serves as the Grey Knight's fleet moorage. It is equipped with powerful weaponry, ready to repel any attacks as the first line of defense. Here, servitor specialists of the Order are also trained, who will later lead the spaceships into space, the Grey Knights, by the way, have their own Navigator House, which also keeps the Order's secrets from birth until death. All the equipment for the Secret Order is produced by the Steel Forge of Deimos. This is a Martian moon, which was moved to Titan using ancient technologies. Ever since the factories of Deimos have been producing ammunition for Psy Cannons, Dreadnoughts, Nemesis weapons, as well as Grey Knight spaceships day and night. The created patterns by Mechanicus are transmitted via eyeless servitors, whose senses and consciousness are dulled to the extreme, for the Grey Knights keep their secrets even from the Adeptus Mechanicus. The current Grand Master of the Grey Knights is Aldric Voldus, who took the place of his predecessor, Valdar Oricon, after the latter was killed by the psychic sting of the Lord of Change Makarchen on the fortress planet of Long Blessing. Voldus, clearly following in the footsteps of Drago, seeing the demise of his master, unleashed all his might on the demon. Pushing back Makachan, he managed to summon Kaldor Drago into this world, lighting his way from the realm of chaos. Seeing in him a great hero, Drago immediately made Voldus a grandmaster. And since then, he has been successfully killing enemies not just with his psychic powers, but also with the combat hammer Malleus Argorum forged by blindsmith Gulliver. Voldus took on the title of Supreme Grand Master following the discovery of the Great Rift. Reluctantly, of course, but who, if not him? Drago crowned him after the defeat of one of the Tsench cults, once again highlighting his skill. There are a vast number of different campaigns in the history of the Grey Knights. Some of them are utterly bizarre. Overall, the campaign stories of the Grey Knights deserve a separate story, but today I will still tell you something. For instance, the event of the Silent Heresy, when Zinch's followers magically stole the gift of speech from all the inhabitants of the planet Sundal. In an instant, all the inhabitants of the world stopped speaking. The cultists began killing them, and they couldn't even scream in pain. In a year, Sundal turned into a silent hell. This phrase best suited this planet. Thousands of rotting corpses lay in the streets, and the survivors hid in corners like rats, afraid of falling under the hot hand of the Tzainch followers. Arriving at Sundal, the Grey Knights, of course, were surprised by what was happening. In the almost grave silence, the shots of assault bolters and the crackle of psychic discharges began to sound. It goes without saying, none of the Tzainch followers survived, and not many locals were left either. But the main thing is... What can be done with the planet? Resettle it. It happens that demons try to break through directly to Titan. For example, the demon assassin Gekstan, a minion of Slanesh, tried to get to Titan along with a group of Grey Knights recruits. He lay in wait on the plains with Sanadu and waited for a suitable neophyte. But he failed. One of the recruits caught the demon and imprisoned him in the body of another neophyte. I think that's part of the trials. And he indeed passed that trial. The Grey Knights constantly have to deal with various strange people, and that includes among the Space Marines. Sometimes certain planetary governors act foolishly. In the 40th millennium, on the planet Harvard III, the local governor decided to make a spectacle of the execution of 666 heretics. The event was powerful. Clowns all around, cotton candy, balloons. It seemed, though that this way one could easily summon a bunch of demons into the real world. As soon as the last of the heretics died, a well of emperors opened on the planet, from which thousands of demons began to fall upon the crowd. In just a few hours, the planet turned into a cradle of madness. The body of the foolish governor was possessed by the prince of demons, Slanesh, and together with his golden army, he began the conquest. The Grey Knights, naturally, immediately flew to Garvard III, in large numbers, and found that the possessed governor was staging bloody games with the surviving inhabitants of the Imperium. Either you participate in the games, or you are thrown into the warp. 
For the Grey Knights, Slanesh also prepared a series of obstacles, mazes of living, screaming flesh with demons at the corners. Naturally, the Grey Knights could not be stopped, and they made their way to the Gates of Chaos, where the Governor Slanesh sat on a throne made from bodies. In this battle, twenty Grey Knights perished, but they managed to expel the demons. To seal the well in the warp, the Grey Knights piled up the corpses of innocently slain upon the bodies of the executed heretics, so that the blood of the innocents would stop the madness. For the Grey Knights, this is a common practice. An interesting event occurred with the Grey Knights on Rakos, where a civil war broke out, instigated by the local planetary governor who convinced the armed forces to rise against his own regime. With the help of the latest missiles, the rebels began bombarding the planet. The missiles disturbed the tectonic stability, resulting in the death of millions of locals. Afterwards, it turned out that the governor was actually a Tsinch changeling who used these millions of deaths to summon demons. The Grey Knights, who never rest, headed to the planet in as many as four brotherhoods under the command of Grandmaster Driston Krom. Along with him came the famous Arvan Stern, who was asked to guard the spaceport zone from where the refugees were being evacuated. Driston Krom began to toss the broken finger bones of saints into the opened warp portals, thereby blocking the path for other demons. The most important thing in this situation was to catch the instigator, and Arvan Stern realizes that he is trying to escape with the refugees and cannot be allowed to leave the planet. What do the Grey Knights do? They destroy all of the refugee shuttles, killing hundreds of thousands of people to save millions on other planets. The Changeling is also crushed in the process. Once the prognosticators of the Grey Knights received a signal from an uninhabited part of space. Such signals should not be ignored, and the Order sends a strike group of Grey Knights there. On sight, they find a huge carcass of the Eldar Malantai world ship, and eaten away by Tyranid bioacid. It turns out that the Keeper of Secrets, Nakari, decided to visit the dead world of the Eldar to indulge in soul stones. But Brother Captain Pelinor was pre-warned by the prognosticators and took with him more purifiers, whose flames burn the Slanesh demons. Nakari found himself surrounded in the fractured dome of the Crystal Seers. He fought furiously, but ultimately slew Justicar Anval Fawn, plunging a huge blade into his chest. As he tried to withdraw it, the surviving purifiers conducted the rite of the twelve bloody swords, depriving the demon of his strength. Then he was finished off by Brother Captain Pelinor. The body of Anval Fawn was eventually taken to Titan, and a lavish ceremony was held in honor of his funeral. But during the process, it turned out that someone was screaming and knocking on the lid of the sarcophagus from the inside. The Grey Knights lifted the lid and realized that Anval was alive. This, of course, raised serious questions among the Battle Brothers, as they thought Anval was possessed by a demon. In the end, he was subjected to several years of interrogations and examinations, and even torture, after which he was returned to service. So, Anval Fawn is the Eternal from the Grey Knights. By the way, the Grey Knights have a prophecy about the Eternal Warrior, who will eventually fall surrounded by enemies at the foot of the Golden Throne at the hour of the last battle. The most serious battle with the Grey Knights occurred during the First War of Armageddon, where Angron arrived with his Legion of World Eaters on the Space Wanderer the Devourer. The demons were held back by the Space Wolves, led by Logan Grimnar, and then the Grey Knights arrived almost in full force from Titan, a total of 109 Paladins of the Order. Only 19 warriors were left to guard the fortress. Heroes first engage in battle with Angron's guard and then with the Demon Prince himself. It was in this battle that the Grey Knight Hyperion managed to break Angron's sword with his psychic power and faith, of course. After which, at the cost of the life of brother Captain Avrilin, Angron was sent to the warp for more than one hundred standard Earth years. After the victory over the World Eaters and Demons, the Inquisition began purging the planet, because all locals had seen both the Demons and the Grey Knights, so they needed to be executed, or at the very least have their memories erased. The Space Wolves, shocked 
by the locals being herded into concentration camps, decided to help the population escape and covered the refugee ships in space with their own ships. They destroyed numerous transports of the Imperial Guard and set fire to three nearest worlds so that no one could tell anyone about the invasion. Several billion citizens of the Imperium perished, after which the Inquisition declared it to be heresy of the highest order and began fierce disputes with the Space Wolves. It should be noted that not everyone was for the large-scale purges, especially the Grey Knights. They were actually distraught when they began to be used in the mission against another order. It was the Grey Knights who named the campaign against the Wolves months of disgrace. In the end, the Grand Master proposed to the Inquisition to capture Logan Grimnar, so that the Order would surrender and his plan was approved. For this, it was necessary to offer negotiations to Grimnar in the neutral star system of Hikarion. It all ended with a battle during which four ships with Space Wolves' escort were destroyed, after which Inquisitor Kisnaros declared that he was ready to accept Grimnar's surrender. He agreed for appearances only, and together with the Wolf Guard, he headed to the ship Fire of Dawn, where the Inquisitor and his entourage, along with the Grey Knights led by Jaros, were located. The situation was unpleasant. Kisnaros lured the wolves into negotiations and then ordered an attack on them. This was a dirty trick of the highest order. Grimnar came to the ship not to surrender, but to ensure the guilty were punished. Upon learning that Master Jaros had ordered fire upon the Space Wolves' ships, Logan Grimnar plunged his axe Morkai into his chest. During the escape, four more Grey Knights were killed. It all ended with the siege of Fenris and the awakening of Bjorn, who sorted everything out. Because the assassination of Inquisitor Kisnaros by Logan Grimnar proved to be insufficient. After which, the Inquisition backed down to avoid starting a war with the Space Wolves. Furthermore, their memories were not erased, and they know about the Grey Knights. Yet the Inquisition started to watch them more closely, as if it were possible to watch any closer. Interestingly, the people who ultimately escaped from Armageddon ended up being corrupted and formed several cults on the distant frontiers. Now, the First War for Armageddon is not even numbered. We immediately start with the invasion of the Orcs. Among the Grey Knights, there's a lost brotherhood. Back in the 34th millennium, the brother of Captain Edian led several units of the Blades of Victory in search of a demon. But suddenly all communication with the Second Brotherhood was lost. The Lost Brotherhood returned after 2,000 years. The prognosticators on Titan received information about warriors who followed the demon into a warp region that was literally created from forgotten moments. Brave warriors fought in the endless battle right at the foot of the demonic fortress. They died but were resurrected again thanks to their unwavering determination and psychic powers. At some point, the demon was destroyed. However, the Lost Brotherhood, thinking it had only spent a few years in the warp, began to rapidly age and wither upon exiting it. Brother Captain Edion managed to send an encoded signal to Titan. I think there's more to it than just aging in this situation. Such is their life. And all because being a Grey Knight is difficult. There are no fanfares or celebrations throughout the Imperium for you. That's what they are, these Grey Knights. I'm glad I finally managed to make a long story about them. And there's still more to mention, so don't relax yet. 